All right. Now I want to talk about some work I've done in the space that sort of responds to, I guess, responds to some of these problems. And I want to point out that the problems I just mentioned, you know, I think are known to most of us. Um, I guess I also want to make one last point before I move on, that I think is of some importance, which is that we should also recognize that there is monolingual work of value that actually respects typological diversity too. One example that comes to mind is all the work on German, which is by no means a less resourced language, but a lot of this work suggests that uh, German's relatively free word order causes problems for models that have to be syntactically sensitive and that adding sort of like morphological information to those models improves performance. That's an interesting result that comes essentially from comparing English and German. And it wouldn't be, it would have been difficult to obtain that result in a massively multilingual setting. In the next setting, I want to talk about some uh, collaborative work I did with uh, this team here, including our host. Um, in which we tried to understand, uh, sort of understand what's going on in errors in a massively multilingual shared task. Let me give you a little bit of context. Imagine I'm, I'm building a system for natural language generation, perhaps a system that reads the weather out. This is actually a common request um, in less resourced languages. A system that can like read dates and times is uh, often considered really useful and is not terribly hard to make. So here I imagine I have sort of a markup that gives you a, a markup buffer of some sort that gives you weather information. It's got the temperature as an integer, it's got the conditions as an num, and then it's got a location string uh, as well. And then the template is something like it's temperature degrees and conditions in location. So I can say something like it's 53 degrees and cloudy in Brooklyn. It's warmer than that today. Note that when temp is one, though, we need to use the form degree instead of degrees. Obvious point, we need to do number agreement. But this gets a lot harder real fast. And the example I always turn to is Russian. Um, in Russian, we have different forms of the word meaning degree, gradus, depending on the preceding numbers. We have, um, let's see, I'm going to attempt this here. Odin gradus, dva gradusa, um, piat gradusov. We have um, one degree, two of degree, three of degrees, roughly. And the rules are, you know, also a little bit fancy because they look at the last term in the number name, not actually the absolute magnitude of the number itself. So it goes, if the last term in the number name is singular, we use the nominative singular form of the word meaning degree. If, if the last term is pockel, we use the genitive singular. If it's plural, which is defined as five to nine, we use or bigger like words like 100, we use the genitive plural. Um, I can't help but noticing this thing here. Here's another example where Russian has annoying internal number agreement. It just happens to be a September 3rd. Um, so I, and thank you uh, for reminding me of that. Here we also have like a genitive singular agreement here with uh, the word third. So this I think is what inspires the tasks, tasks on inflection generation hosted by Connell and Sigmar Fahn. Um, in the 2007 and 2008 shared tasks, there was a subtask in which we did the following. Given a word in citation form, which we'll call the lemma, and given a morphological specification, which we'll call the inflection, we want to generate the appropriate inflected form. So here we have examples from English, German, Hungarian, and Russian. Um, in uh, German, for instance, we have the, the term, the compound noun Stiefvater, which literally means, quite literally means stepfather. And we want to generate the accusative plural, which just happens to be equivalent to the nominative plural, which is Stiefvetter. Um, we, the plural is formed by umlauting here. In English, we have an annoying orthographic uh, detail to form the past participle of the word permaban. We have to, we have to double the N, and so on and so forth. In this work, we developed an error taxonomy for understanding these inflection generation errors. And then we also applied it to sort of perform a manual error analysis of a small subsample of the Connell Sigma Fond chair task from 2017. The systems we use are both closely related to the work by, um, uh, by the folks from Germany. 
um, which included um, a recurrent neural network, with RNN, with a, a GRU encoder, GRU encoder, a unidirectional GRU decoder, and sort of the standard soft attention mechanism. Also uses some interesting data augmentation tricks to basically cause the help the model to learn to sort of copy the stem when it doesn't know what else to do. This was ranked the best overall across all languages in the shared task. The second best system was actually somewhat different internally. It's essentially what I might call a neural transducer. It's trained with imitation learning and uses sort of this neural encoder decoder hard monotonic attention mechanism and sort of spits out edit operations as opposed to spitting out um, the actual sequence itself. This is ranked the second best overall, but it was quite close in performance. And it was the best on eight of the challenged languages, including two we cared about, namely Hungarian and Spanish. These systems are both neural networks, but they're quite a bit different in how they work internally, I would say. The shared task data came from Unimorph for all the languages we target. Unimorph is a free morphological database. It is by all accounts massively multilingual. Um, because that data is in turn extracted from paradigm tables from Wiktionary, the free collaborative dictionary. The shared test the data is sort of sampled using word form frequencies from Wiki Wikipedia. Uh, systems were evaluated lo in low, medium, and high data conditions. We focus on the high data condition because, frankly, the systems worked terrible in low and medium language conditions, uh, out outside of maybe a couple languages which were just kind of easy. When we wanted to develop a taxonomy of errors, we were influenced by a, a debate from the 80s. Um, Rummelhart and McClellan, uh, at, in an early paper, built an inflection generation system for English using a very primitive early neural network. Um, the debate about the system centered in part on what kinds of errors it made and sort of were they good or bad errors. So um, Pinker and Prince and Sprout critiqued the system for making what I'll call silly errors. For instance, when asked to generate the past tense of the verb male, it generated membled. Now, it should be obvious to you that there's nothing like that in English. So there are many uh, errors that involve doing violence to the stem to form the past participle, the oblauding system of English. It's generally accepted that there's nothing, nothing changes AI to M E M B L or whatever. There's simply nothing like that in English. I have no clue where it got that. And there's some, there's some debate about whether modern neural network architectures do these kinds of errors anymore. Um, so Kirov and Cotterell says that, they, that these systems generalize, modern systems generalize well, but don't really make these bizarre errors. Um, Corkery et al. argue that, well, that's basically true. These, the, the predictions still align poorly with human productions. I have no dog in this race, just, note, just noting that, that dispute. The taxonomy we developed has for the four large error categories, one of which is split into sub errors. We've already discussed these silly errors, bizarre errors that sort of defy linguistic char characterization. Oper this is sort of operationalized in our annotation guideline as ones which um, don't have any, there's nothing like it in language. Um, there's, no, there's no analogy one could draw to generate that error from the actual data in the language. Um, the other kind of error are what we simply call allomorphy errors, which are cases where it misapplies existing independently attested allomorphic patterns to the wrong stem. So this is sort of like wrong suffix, wrong stem change, but not bizarre ones. Um, we also recognize errors that are purely in the, the, the language specific spelling rules and don't have an other, they don't have a linguistic characterization outside of sort of rules of spelling. These do occur. Finally, we talk about target errors, which are, are errors where the data is wrong. There are three ways the data can be wrong. First off, it can be the case that there's free variation. Multiple word forms are sort of permitted by the, by the language, but only one is present in the gold data. Um, due to deficiencies in Unimorph itself, it is impossible to say that, like a language, that you, there are multiple past participles for this word. There's simply no way to annotate that in, information. There's also errors that occurred in the Unimorph extraction procedure itself. Um, that is a big script, and the script makes errors due to difficulties in sort of parsing the tables. Finally, there are errors in um, what is on Wiktionary itself. Sometimes Wiktionary had, has or had errors. 
in the data because of human error. We, we were able to doubly annotate three languages and compute our inner annotator agreement. Um, here you see that the Krippendorf alphas are quite high. Uh, this is generally considered to be in the realm of very high agreement. So we believe that we did this in a highly consistent fashion because uh, the two annotators that were able to do Dutch were able to obtain sort of the same classification with a high, a much higher than chance, um, near perfect agreement. We couldn't do doubly annotate all languages, but these are the three we could, just using expertise in our group. Here's a table sort of summarizing all the languages um, and how many errors we had. Um, note that I've given sort of check marks for the languages which have this category. So obviously English has adjectives, but adjectives don't show enough agreement to make them worthwhile for our shared task. Similarly, Dutch has nouns, um, but for whatever reason, there isn't, a, there isn't Dutch uh, like noun plural data, even though it's actually not, a, not uninteresting in Dutch. Um, this, there just simply wasn't pulled out of, of morphological tables in Unimorph 2, the data used for this task. Uh, only a handful of languages have sort of like all three forms, so Finnish and uh, Romanian and Russian do. Um, note that there's, in a couple languages, there, you know, some languages only have dozens of errors and some languages have hundreds. Um, note also that there's a relatively high degree of overlap between what uh, examples are errors for the two top systems that we evaluated. So for instance, in Dutch, 84 of the ones that are errors for the UE system are also errors for the Cluj system. Let me go, go through a couple uh, patterns of error to talk with you about. Um, the first ones are call, I've called target errors. These are very common in certain languages. Uh, so in, there's quite a few errors of free variation in Finnish. Uh, for, there are five different possible genitives, plural forms of the word meaning apple in Finnish, but only one is found in Unimorph. Uh, there are serious extraction errors in Hungarian, Latin, and Romanian. I believe all these have since been corrected in Unimorph, um, thanks to our work, in part. Um, the, the one in Latin is quite egregious. The lamadas don't have macrons, uh, making it basically impossible to do the task with any degree of sensibility. Macrons indicate long vowels. Um, they're present in the inflected forms, but not present in the lamada. Um, also, there are some occasional errors in Wiktionary itself. For instance, there was an error in Spanish that I was able to trace down with the help of the Diccionario de la Lengua Española from the Real Academia Española. Um, we also do find occasional silly errors, ones that are just simply do not have any precedent in the language. Um, these seem to be slightly more common for the soft attention model than for the Kluge system, which uses the hard attention mechanism. Um, the German one appears to be sort of an error of truncation. Um, here, there's a very, very long word that means pesticide, very long compound. For whatever reason, it's sort of just truncated near the end. That would be my best guess. Probably just never saw a word that long. Um, there's a very strange error in Latin that has, that has no um, obvious um, predecessor in the language. Um, in Russian, we also see some errors of this form. Um, it changed an R. It just simply deleted an R. Um, for whatever reason, in this data singular form, um, in this sort of compound phrase, meaning forced labor. Um, also, we have some really weird Spanish errors where it's, it changes an A to a way. Um, that doesn't happen uh, here. That's not a possible change in Spanish. It should be, it should be yay, and if it's going to diphthongize, not way. We had a huge number of allomorphy errors. I'm not going to tell you all about them. I'll just tell you a handful about, about a handful of, of them. We saw over application of oblaut in Dutch. Dutch does have oblaut patterns like German, um, but they were occasionally over applied. So for instance, print is the verb meaning print is a weak verb. So it should, it should, for, it should not have an oblautine uh, past participle, but the system predicted for the past participle prompt as opposed to printa. Um, in German, we also have a, a weird oblaut pattern here um, for the verb uh, um, for sink, uh, for sinking. We also see some under application as well, though. Uh, it should have been zof um, was drinking, but we got zoft instead. The Hungarian's an interesting case here. Um, the Hungarian noun plural suffix k usually has a linking vowel, of which there are several. 
but if the stem is back controlled, if the stem takes back harmony, whether you get an A ah or an O, oh, both of which are, are back, is largely unpredictable. And this is well known from the literature on Hungarian. Both of my Hungarian textbooks tell me this. And so basically you have to memorize what kind of linking vowel it goes with. And in fact, we see many errors here. This is a word meaning massage. Obviously it's a borrowing. We got the wrong linking vowel in one of the systems for a rare form, the elative plural. Um, in Polish, we have a not dissimilar example. Uh, a uh, Polish has what are sometimes in the West called years, which are fleeting vowels. These are vowels that sort of pop up in certain tense forms and disappear in others, usually in the middle of the stem. Uh, we know that these can't be analyzed as epithetic or um, because what, what their quality is is unpredictable. Um, so you sort of just need to know whether a stem has a year in it or not. And we got a bunch of errors of year. So we have, um, I'll, att I'll attempt this. Um, Polish word here, klesenk, or it should have just been uh, klensk instead for um, the noun meaning defeat. So here it, it sort of inserted a year that isn't there in the stem. It could be there. That's a perfectly good, that is a type of word shape we do see in Polish, but this is simply applied to the wrong word. It's, an al it's a classic allomorphic error. We have errors in, uh, other errors in Polish is similarly, there's two genitive singular suffixes. And linguists have long agreed that you can't predict which one you're going to get. You have to memorize it for each stem. There's no obvious default either. They're about equal, equally frequent. And this leads to many errors here. So the word for atheist, it, it's a ah genitive singular, but for whatever reason, the system guessed ooh. What was it supposed to do, though? Um, it's not really clear. The, uh, linguists have long said you cannot guess based on the semantics or the shape of the stem. Um, which one you get, you simply have to memorize. Um, uh, German has some fun errors with separable prefixes. I'm going to kind of just skip over these quickly here because I have quite a few of them. Um, uh, it has trouble understanding aspect in Russian, about knowing about whether the form should be synthetic or analytic. Um, it has trouble with um, harmony in compounds in Finnish because you sort of have to know where the compound boundary is, and that is not eminent from just looking at the form of the stem or of the citation form, the lemma. So you get errors that are harmony errors where it doesn't understand where the, where the boundary is essentially in the compound or that it's a compound at all. We have seemingly rediscovered what linguists have long known. Some allomorphy is genuinely unpredictable. Uh, if you read ancient, um, grammars or grammars written in German, they often, the section on, on morphology is also often called accidents, meaning acci something roughly like accidents, because these things are unpredictable. Um, the things that are unpredictable that linguists, you know, that we could, we could in theory clue these systems into are inherent features not included in the unimorph feature bundles, like animacy and aspect in Slavic. Also, uh, an animacy, gender, and aspect in Slavic. Also, we also see that highly abstract morphological patterns like German, Germanic oblaut and umlaut, Finnish consonant gradation, Hungarian linking vowels, Slavic years, Spanish diphthongization, all things that are heavily studied by linguists as highly abstract morphological patterns cannot be predicted from the citation form alone. So this is, and the systems do poorly on these features. So for instance, there's some work um, done um, by Guskova and Becker and Becker and Guskova uh, developing computational models of year deletion, and similarly by um, Adam Albright on computational models of Spanish diphthongization. Both of them are linguists who explicitly reject this type of morphophonological abstractness we find that the even modern neural networks need. And I think the reason that their systems work at all is that they focus on speakers' nonce word judgments, which may be different than simply memorizing the pattern. Their systems are much less powerful pattern recognizers than a modern LSTM encoder decoder with attention, I would argue. Uh, yet, and so if you're interested, of course, in knowing how this sort of WUG testing thing behaves, well, we had a shared task about that at Sigmorphon this year, and you can check out the results. Finally, there are a bunch of spelling errors, though they're relatively er rare overall. One last point here. You might 
wish that we could automate these error classifications so that the system could be integrated into a rapid development process or used as an additional objective during model training. Perhaps we want to avoid certain types of errors or you know, augment the data so, or, so you can sort of penalize them. I think this would work so long as it has reasonably high agreement with our human experts. Ideally, such a system would scale to arbitrary languages, though, and it would not require linguistic expertise. That is a hard problem, and which I leave for future work. I believe this is my pausing slide here, yes. I'm going to pause again.